hand over now to David. Thank you, Grant. Is that too loud or too quiet or, or okay? Cool. Um, so has anyone heard of Koha, the library management software? Oh, that's quite a few more. So some of these things I'll skip through, and but um, some things hopefully give you a bit more insight. Um, I'm probably not the best person to speak about Koha. Um, we've got a developer in the room, Alex, over here, and Christina taking the videos told me she'd, she's got a, pa a patch in Koha as well. So, And maybe some of you do as well. So I don't have any patches in Koha, so <laughs> one step ahead of me. Um, so I thought I'd talk about Koha and a little, a little bit ab about the software. So just to give you a general idea what it does. Um, I had the privilege of going to CohaCon um, in September in Portland, Oregon. So I, that's the annual conference, worldwide conference that the community has. And, um, and a little bit about the Koha community, which I think is really cool. So, um, so a quick summary of Koha, and it's nearly 20 years old. It was started in 1999-2000 um, to solve a Y2K bug, if anyone remembers Y2K and all the trials and tribulations that people went through. Um, and it was developed here in New Zealand for the Horofenua Library Trust, which is in Levin area, and, and now it's been progressively adopted around the world by libraries of all sizes and all types. Um, and it now has like a comprehensive set of features that any library that you go into for books and things will um, needs to, to run, run their library. Um, and I guess one of the really neat things about Kohar is it's, it's not just developers or a single company developing Kohar. There's, there's lots of companies around the world supporting their clients who, who run it in their libraries. Um, they, most developers work quite closely with the libraries to add new features and to fix things. There's, there's always something to fix. Um, and there's quite a, I guess, symbiotic relationship. It, it works really well. And yeah, and there's lots of other community members like myself who don't work in a library or don't, um, well, our organization doesn't even use Koha, so, which is a shame, never mind. Cool. Um, so what does Koha do? So if you want to find out what a library has, um, you have a catalogue. And so this is just a quick screenshot of a catalogue. You can search for things and it comes up hopefully with some of the resources they have and you can borrow it and take it home and use it and return it. Um, so the front end's relatively simple for most people, but behind the scenes, there's a whole lot of this functions that libraries use to, to manage things. So, so A, they need to be able to search for <laughs> all the things they've got. Um, they circulate things, so when they send people borrow stuff, they've got to know who's got it, and then when it comes back. Um, in Kohar, it calls your customers patrons, so those are the people who have accounts and borrow things. Um, there's lots of other things. You have to catalog all of these resources, and Kohar's in the library world, and they have standards and a, a thing called Mark 21, and in, which has been going for nigh, probably nearly 50 years, I think. Um, I was going to do a photo of a, you know, a, one of those old school card catalogues. If any, does anyone remember those? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was originally developed back then, and then it was. When computers came along in the 60s, they started making it machine readable. And then there's a whole squadillion list of rules and codes and and it's not really just a simple relationship database. So it's really complicated. Well, if you're not a librarian and you're not a cataloger. Um, libraries have things called serials, so like magazines or journals that have lots of issues. So sometimes they come out in different orders and different patterns. They might come out quarterly or monthly or every so often. So libraries need to manage those. Some people use Koha to manage all their um, purchases so that they have budgets and see how much money they've got left and, and, and know what they can spend. Um, Koha is really cool that it's got a, I guess you 
we call it reports, but it's a SQL query builder. So you can basically query anything that's in the database to create lots of reports. And then there's a whole lot of administration things. So I think one of the sayings I heard a long time ago was um, libraries, like they all look the same, you know, they have books and resources, you can borrow them. But generally every library is quite different. They have different rules about how you borrow things. They all do things slightly differently. Um, so Koha has this thing called system preferences. And every time anyone wants a new feature, Sometimes we add more system um, preferences, and I think there's probably around a thousand of a thousand of them, <laughs> um, and so they all work together. And sometimes they don't. So, um, so just so that libraries can configure c the software the way they want it to work. Um, like most free and open source sof software projects, there's a bit of a workflow, and people use different tools. So. Koha uses Bugzilla to track all the feature requests and problems. And we use Git for version control, like most people do these days. Um, IRC is really popular. There's developers and contributors from all around the world in all different time zones. So um, that and mailing lists and the occasional face-to-face um, -face meeting and the annual conference. Um, really help tie things together. And I guess it's the typical developer, um, typical workflow. Someone has an idea or they have a problem and it's logged and someone, a developer will say, hey, I wanna fix this problem or it's a problem for the libraries I support. And then it goes through, they write some code and someone tests it. Someone says, yeah, that works. And then it goes to, quality assurance team and they say no nah, you didn't do all these things you're supposed to and then it goes round and round and eventually hopefully um, it passes QA and then the release manager puts it into into the next release of Koha so um, we have a couple of interesting rules so there's lots of companies that support Koha and so the general rule is if one company say Catalyst here in Wellington um, fixes something um, and writes some code, they can't sign it off. It's got to be signed off by someone else just so that no one can hopefully dominate um, getting things into Koha and doing them their way. And and then it has, still has to go through QA, which is generally someone else. So um, I think it works really well. Sometimes people complain because it's a bit slow because, you know, <laughs> people you have to convince everyone that you're doing the things the right way. Um, Koha is not just about all the developers, so there's a huge group of people um, making making everything work. So we have a release manager, and I'll come to how, how the releases work. Um, we have release maintainers, so, and I'll explain that in a little bit. There's translation, it's used in many countries with different languages, so you have to translate the interface and manual and things like that. There's documentation, quality assurance, there's people who know stuff about that mark thing, and people who know about um, search and Elastic and some of the other tools behind the scenes. Um, there's a bit of infrastructure, um, and Koha's infrastructures around the world, like most free software projects, we don't tend to have a foundation that looks after everything. It's this support company will look after this Git repository. Uh, this other one will look after, uh, or a community member will look after the website. And there's a reason for that, but it sort of distributes everything around the world and, and no one has total control over the community's um, assets and resources. Um, and you have people who try and break things and fix bugs and look after the wiki. And we have a newsletter and we have some social media. And so I think for like most free and open source software projects, the code is not everything and it's still important, but um, there's a whole whole range of people and roles that make it really successful. Um, oh, right. I haven't mentioned what the technology stack is. Um, so it's... A, Koha is web-based. It's written in Perl. Um, yes, um, it was started 
18, 19 years ago, so Pearl was pretty bee's knees then, and uh, yeah, um, and um, MySQL for the database, Apache, or I think you can run Nginx at the front, I think, if you know what you're doing. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so for the last few years, there's been a development effort to, we use a, a library search tool called Zebra. You may or may not have heard of it. Um, and so that's designed to index um, uh, mark data. Um, so, but we're progressively, some, some libraries are running it in production, they're running Elasticsearch. Um, but it is Gradually, the feature set is making it work a whole lot better, but I think there's still some way to go to make the search better. So when you're searching for, some libraries have got millions of items, and and you want to filter and find things in the text search, so elastic search is the way we're going, but it's taking a while to get there. <laughs> um, I wouldn't call it machine learning, no. Um, but people can rate. Uh, it's probably pretty basic. People can rate things, but um, yeah, and people can create lists to share of of particular topics. So, for example, some libraries might say for coursework for universities, they'll have their reading lists for all the books and one one list for a particular course. So you can easily find those things, but. The type of AI and advanced search like that, yeah, probably not, no. <laughs> but I could be wrong. Um, Koha has a, a six monthly release cycle, so every six months a new version with new features come, comes out. Um, a long time ago it used to be time based, uh, sorry, it used to be just when it was ready, and there was one gap year where it looked like it took about two, two and a half years, I think, to get a release out. So. They basically change to a every six months, and whatever's ready is ready. And if it's not, it goes has to go in the next release. Um, each month, there's a maintenance release, so people have find bugs and fix things that need to be fixed. Um, so generally, yeah, there's a release every month for the main latest release, and the you probably see there's the previous releases there, like 1805 and 1711, so they're generally maintained for about a year and a half, two years. But for the maintained ones, there's a um, there's a maintenance release every month until they stop supporting. But generally, a lot of companies, support companies and libraries, generally run current version minus one, and then. Um, when the current version sort of stabilized a bit, it's generally pretty good, but yeah, you never, sometimes you never want to be the first to try the new version, <laughs> unless you're keen, really keen. Um, and probably the only other stack thing, I was just thinking about your question, was we generally use Debian or Ubuntu for this server software, and to make it easier f to maintain, they use Debian packages so otherwise Koha's uh, written in Perl and s someone said to, to me during the conference said about well, half the co the, the modules and uh, Perl modules that they use from CPAN is about the same amount of code as what's in Koha so there's a lot of reuse I guess of other things other people have done. Um, so, as I said earlier, I went to the Koha conference in Portland. Um, it's, we try to have it in a different continent every year, which generally works. So, it moves around the world a bit. Um, it's, been in, it's been in Scotland, it's been in Edinburgh, um, Nigeria, um, here in New Zealand in 2010, um, a few other countries which I just can't think of now. Um, it's generally held over seven days, so it's quite a big stretch of time. Um, so has anyone been to conferences normally that long? I know Linux Conf is normally five days, but um, yeah, so it's quite a, you don't have to stay for all of it. The normal format is 
the first two or three days of presentations in the conference proper. And then there's a cultural day or a relaxation day where you do various things around the country you're in. And then the last two or three days are normally a hack fest where everyone gets together to try and improve things. So, and a lot of people uh, normally only meet face to face at the conferences or regional events. So having the worldwide one, you get people together talking about all the problems they've been trying to solve via IRC and emails, which, you know, it works, but face to face is sometimes a lot better when you're trying to solve problems. Um, so that was sort of my flight path um, via San Francisco to Portland, which is a top, I, can't, I forget which coast Port, uh, Portland's on, that's the west coast, isn't it? Yeah, cool. So that's 13 hours from Auckland to San Francisco. Um, I went a couple of days earlier because I'm, I'm not really an international traveller and I had the privilege of going to visit Mount St Helens which is, you can sort of see it down the bottom um, with these three gentlemen from Bib Libre in France they're a, a Koha support company and um, yeah, it was really it's a, it was about an hour and a half, two hours out of Portland so so it was a really nice start to the conference to go somewhere and visit something you heard about in 1980 on the news when the mountain blew up. And yeah, if you do, if you're ever over in that part of the world, I'd say go and have a look, and it's pretty amazing. Um, the pre-conference event, um, there was a soccer game. Soccer's big in um, Portland, uh, and this is women's soccer as well. So this was like a near final of a of a soccer tournament. I don't really follow sports that much. But that was a pretty cool as well, where to start. Um, everyone can probably complaining about public transport in Wellington at the moment, um, particularly depending on where you live and the buses. Um, I have to say Portland had really great public transport and, um, and they had the light rail and buses and it was really easy to get around. Um, one other thing, we went to the zoo, so um, somewhere in there is an animal, and I can't see it now. <laughs> um, but the zoo was pretty amazing. Um, and they have a wonderful rose garden, if you're into roses and gardens and things. Um, this is probably the first day of the conference, so there was probably about 150-ish people there, and presenters up the front, of course. Um, you can't see too many people, I think this is a bit early on, so there was plenty of eating out at restaurants and drinking, and Portland's a bit of a uh, craft beer place, so plenty of choice for craft beer and, and drinking and food. And we even managed to get in whatever this game's called um, at the end of one of the days, and there was a lot of fun things on, not just the conference proper. And this was the start of the cultural day. Some people decided they wanted to go for a run. I don't know why you would call that fun, but anyway. Um, there was also a walking tour around um, Portland, so that was really interesting. If, if you do get a chance to do walking tours in cities you don't go to, it's really normally quite interesting. Um, and there was also a Japanese garden tour. So. There's a lot of things happening, not just people talking about Koha and libraries and and there was a lot of drinking and eating and socialising is probably the better way to say it. Um, and this is quite a nice picture from one of the tallest buildings where you can look over all of Portland. Um, it has rivers and bridges and more bridges. It's got plenty of bridges. So. Um, and that's the sort of obligatory conference photo. Um, then we had the Hackfest, and at Hackfests in Koha, we like saving kittens, so, and we saved 158, so that was really quite cool. Um, and a, generally a smaller group, and it, it's not really just about coders, it's it, it developing things, it's people talking to librarians and doing documentation and trying to figure out how to solve some of the um, things people want to, features people want to get in and the best way to do it. And you have to bribe developers and people sometimes, so the 
one of the traditions I found out after I was there was to bring chocolate or something um, sweet from your country to share with everyone else from from everywhere else in the world. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap this up really quickly, but there was probably about 15 or people from 15 or 16 different countries. Um, obviously it was in the US, so there's a lot more people from US, but there was, I think, one of the, one person spent 40 hours traveling from Turkey or Omer being Pakistan to, to come to Koha Khan, so makes your normal New Zealand US flight look quite small, really. Um, so there is a worldwide community. Um, there's people everywhere working on Koha except Antarctica. So if you if you do get a chance to go to Antarctica, we can give you something with Koha on it. So you could <laughs> <laughs> even if it's just a Raspberry Pi, which you can run Koha on, but maybe not for production. Maybe so. Um, there's a lot of individuals and Koha support companies around the world and librarians that support it, which I probably mentioned before. And I guess free and open source software and librarians, their sort of philosophy, I think, goes together really well. And there's a really good, I guess, in a lot of free software communities, not it's not necessarily a great gender balance, but I think in Koha we've got there's a reasonable um, balance of of people from all genders. Um, and my favourite quote, quote from Koha Khan was, um, yeah, loosely governed anarchy with great quality assurance. Um, <laughs> um, we do have a reasonable amount of structure, but um, one thing we don't have is a roadmap. It's normally people working together to solve particular things they want to get into Koha and for the next release. Um, we don't have a worldwide body behind that. We tend to have regional groups and then people work together to solve. It has its challenges, but work together to solve problems. And probably my second favorite quote was from Chris Cormack, who was one of the original developers and works here at Catalyst IT on Koha. And it's basically, you know, the code is important, but it really only serves the needs of whatever the software does for the people who use it. And um, I think that's really cool. And there's a link there to, uh, Chris had a really good summary of the community and what happened at Koha Con, so I'm not gonna repeat that. So, um, and this is probably, to finish, this is probably my favorite photo. There's one, two, three, four. There's eight people there from eight different countries. Um, we had pizza on the second last night. Yeah, I think it was the second last night. Um, amazing pizza, best pizza ever, and I can't remember the name of the place, but if you're in Portland. Um, so yeah, there are people from uh, Sweden, US, originally from China, Germany, Turkey, New Zealand, France, and Australia. <laughs> um, and here's some just some links about Koha if you want to know a little bit more. If you want to try it out, um, there's a demo down the bottom which gives you Koha can be challenging to install. Um, it's a lot of moving parts. It's a database. It's a web server. It's, um, yeah, there's lots of moving parts. So it can be a bit more complicated to install than just a desktop application. So, yeah, trying a demo is um, a useful way to, rather than trying to install it yourself um, first straight off. And it does require some skills in Linux admin, but stuff you can always learn. And I guess one of the things about the Koha community and what I noticed at Koha Con was there was lots of new people that hadn't contributed or um, were, were trying to work out how to test something for the first time. So people were really helpful helping people get up to speed and figure out how things work and and for, in my own case being very patient with me while I said I don't get that <laughs> so. so, sorry what was the question um, I I don't really know but it was probably there's generally a core group of developers, um, so maybe 20, 25, 30, and a lot of the rest, say, 
say at the Hackfest for in particular were um, librarians either wanting to get things in or learn how to do things. So, um, yeah, I, d I don't really know, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> um, and oh, there's some credits. I nicked some of the photos and um, diagrams from other people's presentations. So, And that's, that's about it, really. Unless anyone's got some questions? I don't know myself, but I think it's still Perl five point something. Um, so I'm not. I haven't seen it discussed a huge amount on the mailing lists, but I guess as long as it works, still carries on working. I. I And if on the server side, we tend to stick with the stable versions of Debian and um, Ubuntu, so and tend to you know use the standard packages and things like that. So I guess there would be a if those stable releases changed, it uh, said oh we're going to Perl six by default. There would be probably be a bit of more effort to go to Perl six, I imagine. So. Uh, no, no, I don't use Koha in my work, or, um, uh, and I'm not a developer, um, so I I help a little bit with the documentation. I just like Koha because it's really cool. Um, I like libraries. I've always been reading since as long as I can remember. So I love I like libraries, and and I do work in information management. So libraries are related to that I guess so yeah and I do a little bit of social media for the Twitter and things like that occasionally so yeah